Oh, good? Good. Right. Okay, good morning. Rise and shine. You know, we've all had the coffee. I'm more of a tea guy myself. So, good day. My name is Logan McCarthy. My shop is Graphic Communications, and for my senior project, I did publishing on Apple. Yeah, but that's just a world of fiction. Non-fiction, respectively. I want to start off with the key basics. All whatever is split up into two genre, types of genres. We know this: fiction and non-fiction. With your fictions, you have your realistic fiction, your romantic fiction, your fantasies, your Lord of the Rings saga, your Star Wars trilogies. And non-fiction, we have prose based on facts. So you have your almanacs, biographies, anything factual like the encyclopedia, the dictionaries, and so on and so forth. And I just want to get a quick history over with a history or two. The oldest uh, book known to mankind is known as the Instructions of Shunpak, back in the year 2100 BC. It was a Sumerian book on virtue and community standards. See, books date back to the ancient Sumerians, the Akkadians, and the ancient Egyptians. <clears throat> but books that back then, we wouldn't, we wouldn't know them by books by today's standards. Now, they only started to appear as books, the modern conception of what a book is, in the year 888 AD with the Diamond Sutra. It's an Asian book on uh, Southeast Asian book on wisdom. <clears throat> but that was the first book to use the method of block printing, which is great. We're getting a little more modern. That's the modern with the graphic process right there. But it was very cost effective. It wasn't easy to mass produce books until the 1440s with the Renaissance. Johann Gutenberg invented movable type. With that, yes, he translated the Bible to the vernacular, and the, uh, the reading became widely available to the public books. Uh, completely accessible, and over time it became so popular and so accessible to the point where I like to call literature became a core of media. What I mean by that is, yes, it's in books and scripts, it's also in play productions, but you also need literature for film adaptations. Game development, not just uh, the storyboarding, it starts with the literature process first. There's news and technical journalists. I like to call it the master of DIY projects, do-it-yourself projects. Because anyone can just get down and sit down and actually start it. And that's the benefit. You can share your ideas out with the world, your, your opinion in the limelight. You can potentially gain a writing career. You can earn money on the side. And anyone can just kick it up and start it. The one thing I can't guarantee, though, is success, sadly, is that there is no guaranteed success. Uh, and there is no fixed income. Most writers have a side job to make a living. And, um, we had, it's time consuming. No one can crank out a novel on a, a night. Call me if you do find one. Uh, traditional publishing companies have the ability to reject your book. This is natural. Uh, they're, they're the ones who make the money. They're the ones who make the decision. That's why for starting off, it's a great idea to start off with self-publishing because there's less contracts, there's more creative freedom. Benefits, you set all the rules and all the money goes to the author. <clears throat> There's a lot of nice self-publishing companies out there. I know a few of my favorites are Ex Libris, Authors House, and I Universe, myself. Um, uh, so you pay them for the services and they make the book for you. They can't reject it. You're getting paid right there. They, they make the book, they get the money. What you do with the book afterwards is on your hands. The problem though is, and I have to say it, it is a little cold, but sometimes traditional publishing companies reject the book for a reason. I can't guarantee, uh, no author who does self-publishing is guaranteed with a professional uh, uh, marketing advertising department behind them. So it's very difficult to get their books into stores. Bookstores are more likely to reject their book. If, <clears throat> now it's just not a matter of not knowing who you are, it's also a matter of, oh this isn't Random House, or this isn't Harper Collins, or this isn't uh, Lord Stanley Unwin's office. So you're, it's a nobody stage at that point, self-publishing. But at the same time, the creative freedom, it's all a matter of preference. But no matter if you do the traditional method or you start with the self-publishing method, it all starts with an idea. So write the literature. I know, I found this great site called NaNoWriMo, National Novel Writing Month. It takes place in November. It encourages writers to write a 1,660-word goal a day for 50,000 words by the end of the month. And that's a pretty good-sized novel right there. But one thing they stress is writing first, <clears throat> editing after. So in November, write everything here, just swap where you get down all the ideas, all the actions, all the events, get that over with. And then in December, edit it all. Because if you try to mash them in on each other, it takes too long. It's, it's a very bad soup. I've, no, I, I've tried it very, I've tried it ever since I was the age of 12. Maybe I'd have one by now if I actually deviated from the method. Writing first, editing next, and while you're editing, always act for reviews. Construct, with constructive criticism, you don't want to be stuck in your own head here. Uh, so it's always great to get the outside input. 
And once an author feels they've got their piece of work and they actually want to make something of it, it's time to do what Eisenhower would like, uh, reconnaissance over here. I still like it myself. Uh, look up local libraries and bookstores, all the contact information. Look up editors with, uh, who deal with similar genres to your type of book because they're going to be more interested in your book. And always remember that critique and rejection are a way of life. I know it doesn't say it on here, but that's always a way of life from reviews to agents to editors. Uh, look up the editor information, like I said. Understand who you're dealing with, get the contact information. And once you feel you're ready, I think we should start writing the dreaded manuscript. A lot of people stress out about this. And a lot of people just print this out at home and just hand it in like, like that, you know, maybe a manila envelope over there, but that's not cutting it. That's, you want to show that you have pride in your manuscript too, the raw form, before you actually hand it in. Set indents to half an inch, double space, Times New Roman, size 12 font, basic things like that. But also uh, interesting things like here's a tip. Um, I found it's very helpful if you have a quarter inch margin on the left, top and bottom sides, and a half inch margin on the right. <coughs> Why is because uh, that's, uh, that's an area for the comments section. So, see, editors are going to have to look through this and they're going to make revisions and they want a place to do that. If you don't put that extra uh, quarter inch on the right, <coughs> it's square. They're going to be tempted to put them between the lines, cross things out here, everything's going to get messy, and uh, they're not going to work with, they're not going to want to work with an author that wants to work with them again later in life. So, it's just make it nice, comment section, that's always, uh, that's always a satisfactory thing. And once that's done, just the last little bit of a uh, reminder, just go with anything. It, does it look pretty? Does it not look pretty? Does it look right to you? And if it doesn't, change that. And lastly, an agent. You're probably going to need an agent. Most publishers, especially traditional publishing houses, won't deal with an author <coughs> that's unaccompanied by an agent. So look for agents. Make sure they're reputable. The right agents will send the manuscript to the right publishers and the right editors. And remember that critique and rejection are always a way of life. Okay, so imagine this, we've, sent, we've written a manuscript and we've sent it in now. We're waiting to see if we got accepted. While we're waiting, I want to cover a few topics over here. A lot of uh, people have questions about ebooks. What is that? It's electronic books. It's, it's against snail mail. Uh, it's great because it eliminates the need to construct a physical book. So you don't need to pay for all the pages, all the, all the, all the ink, all the cover material, all the, uh, all the thread to make the sewing. No, all you have to do is make an EPUB format and put that online. It's cheaper for the author, it's cheaper for the reader. Everybody's happy. <clears throat> less money, less, much, uh, less of a gamble, of course. And it's, uh, it's very popular these days. There's a lot of e-readers out there, portable e-readers. There's um, the popular ones, the most popular are the Amazon Kindle and Barnes and & Noble Nook. So a lot of people say the Kindle has more features, the Nook has a wider selection. <clears throat> it's a matter of preference, if you ask me. So, are you a Mac or are you a PC? Same thing. Pseudonyms, pen names. A lot of people confuse the usage for this. And so a pen name or an alias is a pseudonym. And a lot of people say, wonder, well, should I get a pen name? And I'm like, do you really need one? Because pen names are mostly used for protection. Let's say an author wrote something dangerous or had conspiracy theories or touched a very controversial topic, something where if they were walking out in the street and if somebody found out who they were, they'd get a slap in the face for it. That's, that's where you would want a pen name to protect your identity. <clears throat> also, it's used to uh, avoid confusion if, you, if a name sounds similar to another author. Let's say there happened to be a May Bradbury or an A.K. Howling or an Artemis Fox. That's got to change because readers are going to go, oh, there's you know, the new book by J.K. Rowling. Yeah. Oh, the good one. No, the good one. Oh, oh see, I didn't know this about them. Never mind that. It's not going to come up in any science or thought. It's just for easier. It's for marketability purposes. Also, and I know it sounds a little cold here too, but uh, sometimes the name has to match the genre. If it doesn't match, it doesn't make sense. If I'm going through the action section, action and adventure, and I come across a book labeled Monster Truck Rally Massacre in Tuscany 2, and it's written by a original Q Uxbridge the 14th. No dice. It's not going to cut it. The marketability is very poor on that book. So marketability purposes, avoid confusion, protection, 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 always. Also, book art. A lot of authors raise their hand and ask, can I submit book art? I say, yes, you can. Uh, it's, it's, always, it's always encouraged. Just make sure it's creative and appealing to the eye and somehow incorporates the book's theme. Traditional publishing companies typically have a professional design department on their behalf, and they can work with you on that. Uh, but if you submit designs, they can work with it and uh, 
maybe make revisions, edits on sketches or the book art. And actually, it's possible to get that in there. So it's actually a very lenient process. Uh, it's nothing too much to worry about. And one of the final details um, that's <clears throat> figured out in the whole process is the type of binding. So there's all the different types of binding. It depends on what you're writing. Uh, hardcover books, perfect binding. Mine was perfect binding. And then we have other books uh, that take bindings, manuscripts. You'll see that with a thick edge, uh, with the thick edge on the end. Um, spiral binding, straight for calendars and agendas, student notebooks and such. Uh, plastic cone binding and wire stitching, same deal. Uh, so I actually have some news. Let's say we got accepted already. They love the manuscript. They love it. They love it. It's the next Harry Potter. Okay, we're on a roll here. All we have to do is figure out the publishing packages, and then we can actually get around to selling it. So for this, it's simple. I just uh, decide what the book size is, number of copies, number of free author copies, it's a custom full cover. Cover. Uh, is it, what's the paper type? What's the cost? Basic things as such. Um, once that's figured out, I will also go through the booksmithing process in just a bit. But once this process is figured out, we sold the book as the end of one story and the start of another one. See, um, there's the advertising and marketing goes on for a book long after the book's made. I'd say that's the longest part. It goes on until the book is out of print. And so while you're doing that, look for reviews, spread the word, uh, do as many book signings as possible, get your name out there, get known. While, while looking up for reviews, by the way, always be persistent, but never pester. Remember who's asking the favor here. And so search for widely read publications, again, publications that match your genre so that the audience will actually be interested, genuinely interested, it's your target audience. And rejection and critique are a way of life, I cannot stress that enough. Now, my book, I've been writing this for, before I came to Tri-County, so I've been writing it for three and a half years. It's very sentimental to me, I've gone through the whole writing process, I've done the editing, I've asked for reviews, trust me, I've built off the cre constructive criticism. I've been through a battlefield. It's, it's been hard, but it's been so much fun. Um, but that's, I could go on forever. I could do a two, three, four hour seminar and all of that, but I'm not going to. That's fine. I just want to get into the booksmithing process here. So formatting, it is. I used InDesign, which is the, what, I, what I like to call the king of text documents, because it figures out everything from letterheads to business cards to envelopes, everything, even books. So set up the master templates. What a master template is, is you set a master template. Let's say, so all the reading pages will be the same if you set a master template for the reading pages. Same goes for chapter headings. That's where paragraph and character styles uh, come in. Format the reading pages, and then get the basic things. Format all the publishing information. I had to do the dedications, the about the author section, other works section. But uh, it's uh, uh, all those. Once it's done, not export. Well, not export it. Now it's a bit of a pastime. You print it. So always use print book, but never print. Remember, this isn't the sixth grade essay here. It's the whole novel we're talking about. So I set the booklet type to two up perfect bound, and I set the signature size to four. But it can be eight, twelve, sixteen, or thirty-two. I'll explain what the signature is in just a quick second too. It's very important. What it print? Check for errors, make sure it's in chronological order. Er, uh, order. Remember, it's like the halftime show here, where you run a printer, core jokes. And finally, bring it over to the table for a night's arts and crafts project, voting. I wasn't always good with voting, but I had to get good for this. So fold, when you fold an individual sheet in half, that's called a folio. And when you put a certain number of folios together, that's called a signature. A signature size is how many folios make up a signature. I, had, I set mine for four, so I had four folios in each signature. So I folded four pieces in and I put them in each other. One signature, I had all the signatures in chronological order, folded with a crease of the bone, make sure everything's nice, crisp, and flat. Finally, going on to one of the more difficult processes, which was sewing. I actually had to redo the whole process at one point because I got it wrong, but I figured out what it was. Um, I'll go up here for this. Punch eight holes through the, uh, the signature. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Hey, there's a grid that, that there are many templates that you can go by. This is one of the better examples. And so all you have to do is get the needle, right? All the grandmothers can do this, and that's fine. Mine could. So sew in and out through the holes, just like that, weaving patterns, through one signature. Then go up to the next signature, go under the groups from the last one, in and out, in and out. Tie them on the ends really nice and tight. Make sure the whole string is tight, nice and taut. You want it to be a nice, compact piece of paper stock by the end of it. And then 
Uh, another bit of pastime, I have to say, we're two minute warning padding. We uh, apply the glue to uh, paste the cheesecloth to the spine. That helps keep the durability to the book. It keeps the whole thing together. Apply a second coat, allow it to dry. And one of the last processes, which was the application of the cover. Also, a little difficulty with here, but it got figured out. All I have to do is open the paper stock of the book, flat out on boards. Measure a quarter inch out from each cover and spine, and that's how big the boards were going to be. Lay the boards out on top of the cover paper. Measure a quarter inch out from those, and that's how big the image has to be. That has to wrap around the boards, so it all accounts for itself. Excuse me. Print out, print out the image. Print out that cover paper. Get wrap it around. I had to fold it on the triangles on the end, so it's all actually around the covers. Glue it nice and well. Now we have to connect the cover to the actual paper. It's not a book without that, obviously. So attach the end pages I had to do to the cover to the inside of the book and uh, just allow it to dry. That was the final stage. So finally, the end result was this. Could uh, I have the lights on now, please? Thank you very much. Um, actually, right here, I've done many things. I make music, I play soccer, I film birds, I make videos, I do all that. <coughs> but I've worked very hard on this and I have to say that uh, this is the greatest thing I've ever made, without a doubt. So it's very sentimental to me. I'm going to pass this around actually right now. And um, you'll notice it is a little fragile. It is, it is a little fragile. The reason for that is in the last step, the application of the process, uh, yeah, the cracks right there, is because I didn't have access to what's called a book press. That is, when you apply the covers, when you put the end sheets on, you're supposed to close the book and put it in a, uh, a book press, which is supposed to compress it down. It makes the book incredibly stable and completes the gluing process. I couldn't get access to one. So it's a little more fragile than I'd like. But it's very nice, it's fully legible, you can read it, read it, read it all night long. It's a good story, I hope it's a good story anyway. Um, so it's very nice, and it really hits at home, brings the point across. And the last reason is, I dare I say, it is a core of media. You don't have to look up at this, I'll just keep talking. But that's the big thing, is that it is a core of media, and it's entirely possible. Um, see, the importance, stories can inspire generation themes, can devise solutions to real world problems, and literature and media keeps uh, culture alive. This quote by Ray Bradbury that goes, uh, you don't have to destroy a culture, uh, you don't have to burn books to destroy a culture. You just have to get people to stop reading them. And in a way, that's a bit of an impossibility, because it seems life always finds a way to pen. And I thank you very much. I hope this was very inspiring. Uh, I al I'm always in full encouragement. I love meeting other writers, and I love meeting, I love trying to influence. You know, you always want your name in the text. Like, I try my best. But uh, I thank you very much. Thank you heartily. And um, any questions, I'll answer at this time. Just get past here. So thank you very much. And I'll just take a seat right down here. That was not a good idea. Okay, then you. You're fine. You're good to go. <laughs> Priestessness. Okay, speaking as a person whose eyes aren't what they used to be, why did you choose that um, point size? I'm sorry? Is that a standard point size? It is a standard point size. Um, the type is it's a serif font, which is uh, the serifs, uh, as opposed to sans serifs, are the little feet mm -hmm. on the edge. So Arial is an example of a sans serif. Arial is great for short, quick things to just get the message across. But actually, um, it's been proven that uh, through reading uh, serifs, it's e the serifs help you keep your attention longer and focusing on the lines. It's because uh, it creates a sim uh, simulates a bit of a line when you get down to it, the little feet. And that helps a lot of readers uh, uh, keep where they are. Also, the type, uh, the type bar, uh, very typical. Um, the, uh, it's a standard for the, uh, the type. It's just Times New Roman. It's, it's in most books. And um, the type size, again, differs. You get those books that have a lot of really small text. That's great. Heart of Darkness is a great example. Um, but then you have the ones with the big text, a lot more pages. Um, uh, this was just fine for making a nice, uh, the volume of the book, remember I had to fit the whole thing in there. The volume is fair, I didn't want it to be too big or too small in that instance. Uh, came out uh, volume-wise uh, pretty well to what I was hoping for, I'd have to say. And I'm sure that there's a reason for it. Why such a large margin at the top of the pages? 
awards section on the top of the page is because um, that's where the other information is supposed to go about the, uh, the book and the author. And I didn't feel it was necessary to put the uh, to put the process in there. This is uh, this is in its right a very good model, and it but it's still a prototype. Um, the actual story I still have a few chapters left to go. This is the most I could get on there. So I hope to publish the actual thing and mass produce in the summer. So it doesn't have all the trinkets that I would like. Even the chat table contents has a little editing to do as well. Um, but it was put together with as much knowledge as I had at the moment. Of course, it should be. You build the book block before you did the cover so that you could adjust for the spine. That, that yep. really fits really nice on it. Yep. That's the, um, that's the cover paper, which is wrapped around the boards. Um, again, I had to open the up pages for that and measure out the boards for it. That gives it its, uh, gives it its strength. That's a perfect bound book. Hard cover, of course, is you can get thread on the, on the side, and it's a lot more expensive. But trust me, I couldn't go about doing that. But yes, it's, uh, the board, the chipboard that we have in the shop was a very good uh, substitute, and uh, the cover paper was as best as we could get it. Now, before I go home and start my book today, um, what, um, what's a, besides the obvious, what's a reason the publisher would not choose to publish my book? I'm sorry to say that again. Besides the obvious of it just not being a good book, why would a publisher choose not to publish my book? A publisher might choose not to publish a book if, uh, for a number of reasons. One, if it doesn't match their specialty. Some publishing companies deal with a certain type. There are history textbooks, of course. Um, uh, most of the ones up there are uh, Hamill. And um, uh, so if it doesn't match the genre, is one reason. Also, if they don't see the ability in it, remember, they have to make, they get a cut of the profit, too. So they have to make money. They have to understand that this is a good book. J.K. Rowling's uh, first book, Harry Potter, The Sorcerer's Stone, was rejected 13 times before it was finally chosen. And when it was chosen, success, there it was. Uh, I just, just, I can only wonder what the other companies were thinking when they passed that <laughs> along. It could be it's a completely different place right now, Dubai, I'm saying. Yeah. Um, uh, there's, a, again, a few reasons. That's why self-publishing is always a great method to start off first, because you won't get rejected. A lot more creative freedom. It's a lot easier to start off, a lot more confidence at the beginning. Also, in answer to your question, speaking to the importance of an agent, J.K. Rowling didn't have an agent, and after the 13th rejection and her book went to another publishing company, it went to a publishing company that absolutely positively did not want any kind of fantasy, not catering to kids, so on and so forth. And somebody that was working there, she was low man on the totem pole, and she was kind of, you know, she got a low ball kind of a job. Mm. She just kind of sort of got stuck with the, the rejects and picked this particular one up and started reading it and said to the boss, you need to read this. And the boss was like, no, no, that's a big <laughs> scene. She said, no, you need to read this. So that speaks to the importance of an agent, even though that yeah. woman wasn't an agent. Mm -hmm. Right place, right time, that type of thing. Mm-hmm, yep. Again, most, a lot of publishing companies won't uh, accept a writer without a company. That's not accompanied by one if things get too unorganized. You need a game plan person to figure out where things are going exactly, yeah. Um, so I don't have an agent yet, but I'm working. Trust me. Oh, all right. That's, I was gonna ask, that was my next question. Is are you looking for a publisher, or do you already kind of have an idea? Who I have an idea. Like I said, the self-publishing companies that I mentioned were some of my favorites that oh, I was okay. looking forward to. Ex Libris and Office House. Uh, look like the best ones that I want to go for now. I'm also considering uh, e-publishing because it, it might be a lot easier. You just uh, make a form, the e-pub format online, get it on the e-readers. And um, there, uh, trust me, people still read. So, and people read a lot online, so it's very helpful. Um, so, again, like I said, I still got a few parts in the actual story that I have to finish. Uh, three and a half years, for some reason, wasn't long enough. For, Tolkien took 11 <laughs> years to write Lord of the Rings, and he, wow. his style was up waves on the beach, really. So, uh, very complicated. But I'm in a I'm in a reconnaissance stage at the moment. All righty. Well, if you wouldn't mind stepping up for a few minutes while we deliver. Don't mind at all. There we go. And we'll bring you back. So thank you. I just okay, we're going to hold Graves hostage until <laughs> after the critique. <laughs> Because <laughs> a lot of kids, if they get their grades right off the bat, it's like, woo-woo, and they're not listening. Right. And then other kids, if they get their grades 
off the bat, they're like, but they're not listening. <laughs> I understand you. Um, so, how come you're so shy? <laughs> <laughs> That's a long story. <laughs> Actually, freshman year, I was I made an effort to be an extrovert, right? And then the egg toss happened. My friend signed me up for that, and then we failed on the first shot. And so I was an introvert again. And so halfway, through, <laughs> yeah, for the whole class, I'm like, until halfway through sophomore year, it got better. Junior year was interesting, and then very interesting. Then senior year, I'm like, yeah, I am still shy on some points. I admit. <laughs> I was very, very more. impressed with your knowledge. Thank I mean, you. it's, obviously, you are a, a literary. Um, I'm trying. <laughs> um, and I just was impressed when I asked you the question about uh, you know the margin, the white space at the top. I mean, you, you not only answered that question, but you gave me reasons why. Um, when I asked you about the point size, you know, you told me about the point size in a very roundabout way, but you gave me a lot of other information with it. You know, so there's no doubt in my mind that you actually absolutely know what you're talking about. And for you, you know, you may say, well, why wouldn't I know the difference between serif and sans serif? But having been a former fine arts teacher working with graphic communication kids, I'm horrified at how many seniors don't even not know what sans serif is. They can't even say the word correctly. I know. Um, so, serif. nice job. Well, thank you. Um, I was lucky, and you were not lucky enough that I know you, and I had the high expectations for you, but you definitely um, went above and beyond. <laughs> um, I was glad to finally see the product after hearing about it for a year and a half, um, <laughs> and I was very impressed by it. Well, thank um, you. The only critique I had was just when you're presenting um, before mm -hmm. the audience, just try to take it down a little bit, speed-wise. Okay. Okay? But other than that, you, you blew me away. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It's good to put that on the show. So like, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> All right. It's fun, though. So uh, overall, amazing job. Um, and looking at the product, I, I was extremely impressed. Um, the one thing I would say, uh, some things that I did see in the book, uh, there were quite a few pages that had widows at the top, so you might want to work on that. So. Widows, yeah. or orphans, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, as well, uh, gutters, when you got towards like the middle of the book, it was Oh uh, yeah, so. I get yeah. That's again, was, I think the application of the covers again. Um, a lot of things would have been a little better if I had a book press. The gluing would have been better. Wouldn't be as fragile. I think the gutter space would actually be a little better on that. So it kind of pinched in a little bit, um, incorrectly in the gluing process. But uh, again, if I had access to one, I I wish uh, I couldn't get access to one. So I tried. I, I tried as I could. I couldn't emulate that. But, uh, Oh, but I do understand that it is it is a little pinched because of yeah. that. Yeah, uh, definitely. And widows, uh, widows and orphans. Yep, I'll remember that next time. Definitely. Yeah, but like I said, overall, you know, I we were talking about it, and it's like everything else is so great you can't you can't mark that. You know, it's like <laughs> overall very good. Uh, and then the other thing is in your presentation, the one thing um, on you talked a little bit about signatures, and one of the things that you might want to add or or talk about. A little bit more is the fact that so signatures actually started from the fact that the press sheet was much larger and it was folded down to create that signature. Yeah. So that was kind of lost a little bit, but overall, like I said. Okay. Yeah. I do. Yeah. yeah. I see. <laughs> Definitely. I could do that. Actually, I know where you're getting at. Right. So, I skip that beginning process there. You're right. Uh, interesting. I don't remember that. Definitely. I love the signature. Actually, I had the most fun researching the manuscript for some reason. I just found that. These articles, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is great. I don't know if so enthusiastic. <laughs> so, Logan, deservedly so. Um, okay. For your product score, you um, you earned a hundred, so that's excellent. Um, that means that you definitely went above and beyond our expectations. Um, and for a presentation of 99, which again is above and beyond our expectations, so that was excellent. Congratulations. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> I mean. So, so thank now you. when you go out there and you tell your classmates your grades, they're going to turn around and kick you. <laughs> they're going to kick you. I'm a soccer player. I'm going to run out of there. <laughs> <You know, laughs> I'm coming. <laughs>